Just uh, two uh, administrative details. Uh, the first one is about the midterm. The TAs are busy uh, or have finished grading their parts, and I'm going to get the midterms and grade over the two-day break. So expect them back sometime after that. And then uh, secondly, on the project, um, as you're busy working on that, uh, you should be making some headway with that. I just wanted to let you know, and related to the topic we've just finished on membranes, um, we, were, uh, we had a great speaker here at, on campus yesterday talk about membranes and his research, particularly around fouling of membranes. So we, we spoke about fouling during the membrane topic, um, and particularly we emphasize that the, the pores of the membrane can get clogged. But one of the things that might not be apparent is that it's not just fouling through that mechanism, but also through bacterial growth on the membrane surface. When you're treating water, you've got bacteria and the potential for this growth of like, sort of like a slimy surface um, on the membrane will also foul the surface. And so um, this researcher was talking about the application of electric current across the membrane to eliminate that. But now, just think about that for a second though. Electric current on a polymer surface, right? There's, there's no conductivity there, right? So you, you can't actually apply an electric current on the polymer surface, but what you can do and what his research was is all about coating that membrane surface with a conductive layer, and he was using carbon nanotubes. Okay, so if you're looking for an interesting topic around membrane, um, look up carbon nanotubes, surface modification of the membrane for biofilm reduction. So biofilms grow on these membranes and severely, severely inhibit the membrane's capacity. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting topic. The speaker um, was actually a potential new professor that we're looking at hiring from Stanford. Um, so maybe he'll be teaching 4M in a year or two from now. Um, but uh, but uh, that was just, just out there for those of you working on your project in that area. Okay, so today uh, we begin a new topic on liquid-liquid extraction. Um, but before I go through uh, before I go through some of the notes, I'm just going to hand out a short topic, survey that liquid, I'm going to liquid ask extraction. You, to um, you may have heard of the topic before uh, as solvent extraction, uh, which is an okay name, but a more correct way of calling it is liquid liquid extraction. How many of you have done a lab experiment using that sort of equipment that's up there? Okay, so you're, you're very, very familiar with, um, with what's going on there. Um, we have three species in this system. Okay, so we're going to introduce some new terminology, which is a little bit um, overwhelming initially if you've, if you've not um, comfortable with this. But we're going to take a feed stream, and my feed is made up of two, two portions. There's a solute, and a carrier. Okay, so we will use this terminology where solute is often called A, just species A um, of interest, and the carrier then we'll call C. Okay, and these two species are mixed into each other. So we're interested most often, um, is, uh, is the case, that we wish to recover the solute. Okay, so that's my goal is to recover the solute. So I'm going to do a, a small demonstration here, and it's not going to be successful, but it's going to show you the terminology. Okay, so here I've got water, and that's my carrier. And in many cases, that is the carrier in real systems. So water is my carrier, and my solute, I'm going to use balsamic vinegar here, uh, just because it's got some color, but it would be regular acetic acid or vinegar. Um, so I'm going to add that, and it's a small concentration. Okay, so there's my solute and carrier mixed up in each other. Now, maybe add a bit more just to get the percentages roughly correct. In practice, when vinegar is made synthetically, it's about 20% vinegar and 80% water. Okay, so a low concentration of solute, a high concentration of carrier. And these two are mixed. I can't really separate them as is, but I need to try and recover the solute as best as I can. So my solute 
the brown balsamic vinegar here is species A, and the carrier is water. So what we're going to do is, in practice, we're going to add a third element, my solvent. So I bring a third species into the system, my solvent, and I'm going to add that to the feed. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to use a solvent, which is not going to be successful in doing what I want. I'm going to just use oil, but the oil will demonstrate what's, what will happen in practice. So if I, I just want you to take a look here. So I'm going to add this solvent. Okay. So there's my solvent, and what do you notice about that system now? There's, there's a, a phase separation here, right? The solvent does not preferentially go in and dissolve. So in other words, you don't see one uniform phase here. You're actually seeing two liquid phases. Okay, so we select a solvent that has that property so that it will mix in but still be separated. So it doesn't mix in. It, it stays separate. And the hope is that what we end up with is the solute moving into the solvent. So we hope to transfer that solute into the solvent. And I'm using that word specifically, transfer. We're transferring mass. There's mass transfer taking place here. Mass transfer takes place when we have concentration gradients. We saw that in yesterday's class. I introduced that idea to you, and that's why this next topic flows so nicely afterwards. The same concepts apply. Mass transfer is desired so that we move our solute into the solvent phase. Okay. So let me ask you this. Um, is the system at equilibrium? What would equilibrium look like? If, if it was, was it equilibrium, what is the characteristics of equilibrium? Okay, so I've, I've hinted at it, concentration differences. So what would equilibrium look like if the system were at equilibrium? How would you be able to tell? Evenly mixed. Okay, so at equilibrium, there'd be no net transfer of solute to the solvent or back again into the carrier. So the solute will transfer into the solvent, but as much will transfer back again into the carrier phase. Okay, so at equilibrium, those, that solute is moving evenly across. At the same rate, it's moving from one layer to the other, it's moving back again. Okay? Now, this system, you noticed I just added it. I, the oil phase, my solvent phase, I just simply added it in. Would you think this is at equilibrium? Like, do you think there's even transfer of the vinegar up into the oil phase and from the oil back? I, what, do, what might I need to do here? Shake it up, okay? So disperse those two phases inside each other and watch what happens then when I stop dispersion. Okay, so may take a while, but we expect it to settle out. So I'm going to give it some time there. And while it's, while it's separating, I want you to think of this. I chose a solvent that was not effective. That solvent oil is not going to pick up balsamic vinegar. The solvent that would pick up the vinegar very nicely is ethyl acetate, and I don't have some with me. But what, uh, here's what I want you to, to think of next. And uh, you may want to brainstorm some ideas with the person next to you. I did this in batch mode. I added a batch amount of solvent, of solute, and carrier. I mixed it, and I let it settle. And if I let it settle long enough, I will get what's shown up there on the slide. Um, you'll get two phases forming. And we'll give 
names to those two phases, extract and raffinate. And I'm going to show you what I, I'm going to define those two phases in a minute, extract and raffinate. But that's, what you've done there in the lab was a very much a batch process. Okay? Now I want you to brainstorm some ideas. How will you design a piece of equipment to do that continuously? Continuously, you've got three species. The feed, the, which is in other words made up of solute and carrier. So there's your first two, solute and carrier and solvent, coming continuously. You need to treat 20 tons per hour of solute plus carrier mixture. How we draw like a physical cross-section of a piece of equipment that you could use to treat that, mix it, separate it, and have two streams leaving. So you've got two, two streams coming in, feed and solvent. And I want you to brainstorm what's going to be inside this box so that we have extract and raffinate leave it. Okay. So I'll give you a few minutes. What would the equipment look like to do that? How would you design that? What, like anything, you could be as creative as you like. What goes inside that box? Yeah. That could be multiple steps. Okay, so I want you to be fairly creative. You can put anything inside here. It could be multiple, multiple units, anything that as long as you're feeding continuous feed, continuous solvent, you're getting continuous extract and continuous raffinate. So your mass balance balances. Okay, you can't have accumulation in there. Okay, do any groups want to suggest some ideas? Any suggestions? Yeah, do. Um, so I thought uh, just to mix, first mix the, the feed and solid stream. Okay. And then like, put to like, uh, like, like a siphon or, or a centrifuge or something to separate the, the two different, um, uh, like a density of feed or density of solvent, or just, just to separate out the two phases from yeah. each other. Okay, so there's a, a, a great idea. Have a pre-mixing step where you mix that feed and solvent, so like I was shaking that bottle around, but now on a continuous basis, and then feed that output from that tank to a centrifuge or a cyclone, and the centrifuge uh, would separate the two phases from each other. Okay, so you get a, your lighter extract and your heavier raffinate, for example, coming out of the centrifuge. So two, two units, okay? Any other ideas? Other suggestions. That's a great one. Yeah, Joseph. Good old-fashioned Good old-fashioned decanter. So just a static tank with a with a piece of metal. I'll show you an example in a minute that just simply cuts off the where the layer is between the two phases, and then you're just moving your liquid through. Okay. So a decanter. Anything else? Yeah. 
Michelle has a good suggestion. <laughs> Volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I, I'm not really a suggestion. I just think that you do it in a tower. A tower. Like, like one of them coming in the bottom, up top, and the other coming to the bottom and in the mid. And then okay. So, so the suggestion is maybe having using something like a distillation column or a tower. Okay, where you've got your which which phase would you put in here? Put your solvent in there, and then your feed in there, which is your solute plus carrier. Okay. This is, would be the heavier one that would settle down, and then your solvents, the lighter solvent, would, would uh, trickle up. So you get this one phase heading up, the other phase heading down, and they cross paths, and they contact each other. Okay? And then leaving out here, you have your raffinate, and leaving over there would be your extract. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice idea. Um, and you could do a variety of interesting things inside this column. You could pack it with packing. You could actually just use a regular distillation column with trays and openings so that you force the solvent through tiny holes in the trays to contact the solute coming uh, down. You could actually even agitate inside this column. Okay, we can have what's called a pulsed column. Inside the column, you would have equipment of the sort where you've got cutouts over here. Okay, and that repeats a few times. And then inside you have a similar pattern, but this is on a shaft. And that, ver that shaft in blue pulsates up and down. Okay, so you sort of create a pulsating motion and encourage the fluid flow to, to move that way. Any number of interesting ideas are possible here. I'll, let's take a look at a few other pieces of interesting equipment um, in the notes. I'm going to jump over a few slides. We'll come back to this, these definitions in a minute. Um, so here's, here's a piece of equipment where you've got multiple stages. We're going to see this coming up now. This topic that we're going to learn, while it's related to liquid-liquid extraction, applies to a variety of separators, flotation banks, for example leaching, all of those, uh, of those transfer operations and separation operations um, use the similar idea of multiple stages. And so you can run them cross-current, counter-current, co-current. We're going to look at a number of configurations. But here you're essentially seeing a whole bank of mixes. And what happens here with each mixer is the recognition that one stage is not good enough. Okay, so the recognition then that you've got your feed coming in and let's just do co-current initially you've got your solvent and then you've got coming here your extract your extract now contains some solute but what we'll have then is another mixing stage where you give them another chance to mix and separate okay and you send them on to another stage and so forth. You give it multiple times to contact. Here's, an, uh, here's a neat idea that, uh, that ties up with Michelle's idea. If you have multiple CSTRs in series like that, take a look at a distillation column. It's nothing more than just flipping that series that's horizontal, flip it vertically, and you can consider each one of these a mini CSTR inside there. Okay, with, with that same thing happening. Okay, so a, a column is nothing more than really just a bank of well-mixed units in series, conceptually at least. Okay, so, so there's a bank of motors. <clears throat> here's, an, here's an interesting uh, pilot scale unit. And let's take a look at this. This is, um, there's some interesting information that we can actually learn from this photo here. 
This is one of the best things you can do as an engineer, is go look at other people's photos and you re mentally reverse engineer their technology. Take a look there, there's motors, three motors, and in between you've got this units one, three, and five. Motors are in two, four, and six. What do you think might be happening over there? Okay, so you're giving it time to separate. So there's your mixer and there's your decanter. Mixer, decanter, mixer, decanter. So it's what Joseph mentioned, but you've just now got three of them in a row. And that port over there tells you that it's a decanter because someone's put that port over there so they can see inside. What are they interested in seeing? Is this phase separation, okay? So we can learn a lot about this technology. The piping also hints at what's going on. They notice that this is a cross pipe from there to there, okay? Indicating that this flow in the well-mixed CSTR is then being pushed into the settler or the decanter, okay? So we're seeing this idea of multiple units in series. Um, let's take a look at a few more. Here's another technology that integrates both units into one. You've got your feed, your aqueous phase, and your solvent, which is often called the organic phase as well, being mixed. So here's your, your CSTR. And if you feed this in at a continuous flow rate, it's got to go somewhere, and it gets forced out here eventually. So it will mix in here for a while. There will be a certain residence time. That's a function of the flow rate that you're feeding at. And that material that's well mixed now, so it's that dispersion, it's the name we'll call this, this dispersion of the, two, of the two streams move in there. And there's this band, which is sort of not one phase or the other. It's, it's a dispersed band, a well, still well mixed. And you're giving it time to settle into the lighter phase and the heavier phase. So you'll see this terminology, aqueous phase, organic phase. You'll also see the terminology light phase for the organic and heavy phase for the aqueous especially in British books and so forth, they'll refer to it he as heavy and light. Okay, so continuous feed in, continuous feed out at steady state. Let's take a look at a few more options. Here's, um, here's the idea of again an integrated, uh, or uh, just the settler units I should say. So you've got mixing happening and then so that either that mixing happens upstream or you have what's called a static mixer, an inline device that forces the two streams to mix. And then part one is a flow distributor. So you've got flow coming in here at fairly high velocities and you need to stop that momentum in some way. You don't want to disrupt the settling that's taking place downstream from this incoming flow. So we'll create a panel that slowly distributes the feed, breaks the momentum, and then here in this, this phase two is something that looks like this. So we, stuff that you clean your pots with, um, perhaps. Uh, a knit, it's called, here's a proprietary um, name, knit mesh, but essentially it's got this consistency, right? And it allows the droplets, the small oil droplets that you've created upstream now to come together and coalesce. Okay, so here's always the dichotomy in in liquid-liquid extraction. You can put a lot of energy into your system and create a high dispersion here. So create a lot of small bubbles. But at some point those bubbles have to come together again so that you can separate them and, and have your two phases leaving. It's no good being able to mix them together but then they can't separate um, or they take a very long time to separate. So we need some device to help the droplets come together and something like this um, will help. Now, I just want to pause on that point there because there's another in interesting aspect that ties in with what we've studied. We said that this is mass transfer, okay? So you've got mass transfer. That vinegar that I added in here has moved. You can actually see here this, this oil phase has now turned slightly brown. So I've, I did actually have mass transfer from the feed to the solvent. And mass transfer is related to flux. Right? We would like to move that stuff over. And if we 
look at that, it is the mass flow per unit area is equal to driving force over resistance. Okay, so we've seen this too many times in this course already. Take a look, let me just uh, rearrange this left hand side. Mass flow is what we want to increase. How much mass of solvent can we move from the feed into, sorry, how much of the solute that species A can we move from the feed into the solvent? That's my mass flow is driving force over resistance times area. Okay, That equation there indicates why we mix so thoroughly. When you mix, you break up the particles into small bubbles. Okay, And if you take a particle of solvent that's perhaps that size, if I take that same particle of solvent and I mix it really thoroughly, I can break it up into many small particles that are the equivalent volume, but the surface area on that same amount of material now is so much greater over there in green. Okay, So my surface area per unit volume, it's the same volume of solvent, but the surface area per unit volume on smaller droplets is far, far greater. Okay, So what does that do? The area through which mass transfer takes place is now dramatically increased. Okay. Driving force is the, the delta C, the delta concentration between the solvent and the carrier. Okay. And resistance is your mass transfer coefficient that tells you how fast that species A moves from the carrier into the solvent. Okay, so that explains why we really like to agitate and create a lot of fine droplets, but as I said here, at the end we still have to separate those droplets out. And um, this uh, knit mesh coalescer is one way to coalesce those droplets. So there's two words there, disperse and coalesce. They're the opposites of each other. Disperse is to spread in to one phase, coalesce is to bring back. Okay, here's, a, here's a, your standard type of um, settling vessel. You've got your emulsion of the three species coming in. You create two phases and you've got your lighter phase and heavier phase moving off. Okay? And sometimes what we'll get is uh, this sort of scummy layer forming in the middle and we need to drain that off periodically because um, that's going to just accumulate in the tank. Okay, so here's a, here's a suggestion similar to, to Michelle's. We can let light liquid in, our heavy liquid in. They flow counter currents to each other and um, they move out. Okay. We can then um, use a tray type column as well. Similar idea except the material now moves from one tray to the other. And then here's this idea of um, you can either have it pulsate vertically up and down. So this can pulsate vertically or you can rotate that um, in the axial direction and cause some mixing over there. Okay, so a variety of configurations. Here's an, here's an interesting one. Um, so this is a rotating device. Now, the, this entire drum is filled with liquid. Okay, the, the white stuff isn't air. It's, it's, the white stuff is the lighter liquid. So that would be your solvent. And this gray area is your heavier liquid. And what you have is these sort of rotating scoops that scoop the heavier liquid up into the lighter phase and then disperses it as droplets which because those droplets are heavier will sink down and the lighter droplets that get caught on the way going down eventually disperse cross currents into each other. Okay, so that drum just rotates around and you get the um, mass transfer taking place. And you do this, um, we'll use this sort of configuration when you can see here in fact, see how there's sort of like a, I'll, I'll pass this around, uh, you can see that the oil phase sort of has this foam forming on top of it. It's because I shook it so aggressively. Okay, so that aggressive mixing in that instance creates a foam that doesn't really go away. So this 
system is fairly gentle on the two phases. It doesn't cause that aggressive agitation. And so we'll use something like that, um, for, that for that situation. And then there's Dylan's suggestion, which I'd like you to go look up in your own time, a centrifuge mixer settler, where you're using a centrifuge to separate the two phases out. Okay, so any questions on the devices? Okay. Let's, uh, let's just uh, introduce some of this terminology. So to do that, I'm going to go right back to, um, I think it's slide four. Sorry, slide six. Let's go give some proper terminology that we'll use to these uh, streams moving around, okay? So you've seen heavy phase, light phase, aqueous phase, organic phase. Every book will use um, some slightly different terminology, but there is actually a unified terminology for this topic uh, that we should use instead where, where appropriate. So we've seen these terms already. Solute is the species you wish to recover from your feed since your feed is equal to solute, we call that species A plus the carrier C. Okay. So you wish to separate that solute from the feed or the carrier, or sometimes it's even called feed solvent, which is a really bad term because it starts to mix you up with the other solvent that we're going to add. So I'll typically just use solute and carrier as the two names. Solvent then is your mass separating agent. You're going to add this solvent. Um, we'll call that S typically. So that's your MSA that's being added. You do also have to add an ESA, that mixing of the solvent to the feed. The energy to mix the feed and the solvent up is your ESA, but your MSA is a solvent here. Now, we have two streams leaving, the extract and the raffinate. How do we tell one apart from the other? And this, this um, is a little confusing initially to people. The extract is the stream which is primarily solvent. Okay, not solute, but solvent. So that organic phase, the, typically the solvent is an organic that we add and the feed is typically aqueous phase. So that organic solvent reports primarily to the extract. And hopefully, it contains a lot of the solute. It's not guaranteed. If I picked a bad solute, for example, oil, wasn't a particularly smart solute to use to pick up vinegar, okay? So I'm not going to get a whole lot of solute in my extract. But the, the stream that I call and label as extract is the stream that is primarily solvent. And we'll give some symbols to it. We'll call Ye, comma A, is the mass fraction. So that's the mass fraction of A in the extract. YEA is the mass fraction of A in the extract. You can also get YES. YE refers to the extract stream, comma S is the mass fraction of solvent in the extract. You can also get that the carrier C, the carrier doesn't, the carrier has to go somewhere and it will primarily be into the raffinate, but you will get some of your carrier moving into the extract. Okay, so this is where um, we need to start to pay attention, is bear in mind that the, three, that the two streams leaving here, they contain all three species. Okay, so solvent, 
carrier, and solute, all three of those appear in the two outlet streams, but to varying degrees too. Okay, the, the extract stream is the stream that contains primarily solvent, and the raffinate is where any solute that has not moved into the extract, it's the remaining stream. Raffinate is um, from the French word refine. It's a, it's the, you can also see it as residual, the leftover solute that goes into the stream we call raffinate. Okay, any, any conceptual concerns here about that terminology so far? Primarily carrier, yeah. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's just continue with some of our notation here. We call the amount of solid, solute that's in the raffinate, we call XRA. So XRA, the R is for raffinate, comma A is the mass fraction of A in the raffinate. And what we can do is we can create a number called the distribution. This is the distribution of A. A is my solute, right? And the distribution of A tells me, if I take A and put it in that system, how much distributes to the extract phase and how much distributes to the, uh, the raffinate or the residual phase. So we can write that as Y E A comma X R A. Now that mixture that's being passed around, the oil-vinegar mixture, would that have a high distribution or a low distribution? So I used oil as my solvent, and I told you it's not a very effective solvent. It doesn't pick up a lot of solute. So would we expect DA to be a larger number or a smaller number? Smaller, okay. What is the DA value for a solvent that's totally ineffective? In other words, the smallest value that you can get for DA. Is zero, right? You've got a ratio of two positive <coughs> numbers. These are mass fractions. So the smallest value that you can have for DA is zero. So a totally <coughs> ineffective solvent is zero. A solvent that picks up, let's say you have, we'll, um, in next week's class on Tuesday, we will um, have a brainstorming session on how you can, what is the ideal solvent look like, right? And let's say you have an ideal solvent. An ideal solvent would be one that picks up all your solute for you. Okay, so you have this amazing solvent that you find somewhere that will look, uh, capture all the solute out of your feed and essentially take it all with it into the extract, leaving nothing behind in the raffinate. That would be a, a, the most amazing solvent you could find. And that has a DA of one, no, infinity. Okay, so that gives you a, an idea of the, the bounds for DA. It's as small as zero or as high as infinity. Okay. Uh, it does, because these are mass fractions. So if you had this solvent that picked up all species A, leaving nothing in the raffinate, essentially your raffinate is pure carrier. Then. Okay, so here's the idea I want you to think about. What was the purpose of this system? Was to try and get the solute. I started the class by, by today by saying, the goal here is to get the solute out of the carrier. I want to remove that vinegar that I added to the water. But look what I've gone and done. Let's say I, I had a solvent that did that effectively. I've actually just, all I've done is created a new problem for myself. I now have my solute inside an extract. Okay, so I've simply moved my species into another stream. I haven't really separated it yet. Why, why go to all this trouble? Maybe because it's easier to separate the species from the extract. 
Okay, and we're going to see on Tuesday's class next week that what you've essentially done, you've created another problem for yourself, but this problem of separating your solute out of the solvent is an easier problem to solve. Okay? So we'll look at some of that calculations then in Tuesday next week.